Hello, this is the Algebra 2R review of Unit 7 and Unit 9, Day 1. So we'll start out with recapping our rules of exponents again. When we multiply with like bases, we add those exponents together. That would give us a to the fifth. It's when we raise a power to a power that we multiply the exponents together, in this case, to get a to the sixth. If you have several parts of a term being raised to an exponent, you want to apply that exponent to everything. 2 to the third power gives us 8, cubing the y and cubing the z. If we have a fraction raised to the, an exponent, make sure you take everything in the fraction to that exponent. That would give us x to the sixth on top. On bottom, we're cubing the 2 again to give us an 8, and y to the 4th raised to the 3rd gives us y to the 12th. When we divide, we subtract those exponents, dealing with like bases. The coefficients are going to be divided like we normally would, just to get 5. Keeping my like base of a, that would be a to the 4th, and just b. Anything to the 0 power, remember, is equal to 1. So here, everything's being raised to the 0, so we just get a 1. Whereas in this next piece, only the x is being raised to the 0. So that's like doing 3 times 1, which would just give us 3. In the next example, it's just the 5 that's being raised to the 0, not the negative. So it's almost like you have a negative 1 out front and then times 5 to the 0. 5 to the 0 gives us 1. Negative 1 times 1 then just gives us a negative 1. With negative exponents, we take the reciprocal or put it in the opposite place of where it is. This right now is in the numerator. So it will go down into the denominator. Exponent becomes positive after I move that. In the next example, everything would move into the denominator. Placeholder of 1 on top. A and R both moving. Exponent becomes positive. And then you can apply that exponent to both terms to get 1 over A squared R squared. In the next example, only the X is being raised to the negative exponent. So the 2 stays exactly where it is. X drops into the denominator. Exponent becomes positive. In the next one, again, the 5 is staying where it is because it's not being raised to a negative exponent. The x drops into the denominator, becomes positive. The y now goes up into the numerator and becomes positive. If you have a fraction being raised to a negative exponent, we take the reciprocal of the fraction. Exponent becomes positive. We're squaring both the numerator and denominator, which would give us 9 over 4. Now we can't reduce that. You can't reduce a fraction by square rooting. That's as far as you'd be able to go. When you have a fractional exponent, that tells us we can rewrite it using a root. It goes power over root. So this numerator, that's the power. Denominator, that's your root. So as soon as I see a fractional exponent, I draw my root symbol, putting the base underneath. Power of 1, root of 5. And you could just write that as the fifth root of z. You don't have to indicate that exponent of 1. In the next one, only the 3, or sorry, only the a is being taken to the 1 half power. Remember, 1 half power means to square root. So the 3 goes on the outside. I draw my root symbol. Only the a goes underneath, and if I were to write my power over root, you could see that's a one-half power. You don't have to write that one and the two. You could just write that as three times the square root of a. And with this last one, only the y is being taken to the fractional exponent, so the x goes on the outside. I draw my root symbol, put y underneath, power, root. If you're going in the opposite direction, sometimes it helps to write the power if you don't see it in the index or the root if you don't see it. Remember, square root is just one half power. Or if I apply what we just mentioned, power over root. 
Same thing for the next one. Power over root. Same thing for the last one. Power over root. In the next section, we're determining whether we have growth or decay. Remember, we have growth when our base here is greater than 1. If our base here is between 0 and 1, then we have decay. So this says determine whether the function is growth or decay. If I look at this base here, since that's greater than 1, we know we have growth. Whereas this base here is less than 1, so we have decay. If I were to write the equation of the asymptote, that will follow your up-down shift. So here, our asymptote would be y equals negative 5. If you don't see an up-down shift, your asymptote would just be at 0. Here we see a shift of up 4, which means the asymptote would be y equals positive 4. And then stating the transformations. First, this leading coefficient, that's our vertical stretch. Our exponent, that's our left-right shift. And then the constant being added or subtracted, that's our up-down shift. So this 2 out front would tell us that we are vertically stretched by 2. Again, we have a left-right shift up in our exponent. We reverse our logic. We would think this goes to the right, so we know it's going to shift left 1. And then our up-down shift, we don't reverse our logic on that. That would just tell us we're shifting down 5. We're not doing anything with that base. That's just what's being shifted around. And then as far as my domain and range, our domain of all of our exponential functions would just be all real numbers. It goes left forever. It goes right forever. And our range, lowest my, most height to highest most height. Our lowest most height is at negative 5, all the way up to infinity. If you weren't sure, you could type this into your calculator and look at the graph. At negative 5 is the asymptote, so it's non-inclusive. And we can never reach infinity, so that is also non-inclusive, indicated with the parentheses. For the next one, looking at the transformation, the negative out front tells us we have a reflection over the x-axis. And then we have a left-right shift, shifting right 3. And then that constant being added tells us it's going up 4. Our domain, still all reals. Now our range, since this was reflected, so something that might have normally looked like this growing with an asymptote, now since it's reflected, we actually have a lowest most height of negative infinity. So our range we would have negative infinity as our lowest most height, our highest most height. It gets infinitely close to that asymptote without actually crossing it. And that's it for those. Next, we're looking at exponential regression. And your calculate, calculator will generate this equation for you. You just have to enter in your data into list 1 and list 2. And then you're going to use exponential regression, which is choice zero under that calculate menu. So if I bring up my calculator and I hit my stat key, I want to first edit my list. Now for time purposes, I've already entered this data into my calculator. So now I'm going to go to stat again. I want to go over to calculate. And I'm going to go down to choice zero, or you could just type in zero. We have data in list one and list two, and then just tell it to calculate. So the equation that we're plugging into 
is y equals ab raised to the x. Again, that was on my calculator a moment ago. That tells you what the equation is. It tells you what your a value is. It tells you what your b value is. And then you just have to round appropriately. We're told to round to the nearest hundredths. So if I do that, we would have y equals 5.17 times our b value, which was 1.09 after rounding, and then just leave it to the x power. Next, talking about logs. Remember with common logs, your base, if you don't see it, is 10. So if you don't see a base, assume to be 10. With natural logs, the base, if you don't see it, is assumed to be that constant of e. When you're going from log form to exponent form, which is what we're doing in these first couple examples, we just use our lasso method. So right now we have a log to change it to exponential form. I would just rewrite that as my base is two to the fourth equals 16. Same thing for the next one, we just lasso that up. We'd have nine to the one half power equals three. Now when you're going from exponent form to log form, you're gonna use that BAP acronym. We write our log with our base, which in this case is four, of the answer, which is 64, it will always equal the exponent. Same thing with the next one. We would have log base 25 of 125 is equal to three over two. In the next one, since our base is e, we're going to use the natural log. So we're going to have the natural log, base e of y, always equaling that exponent of x. If you did not indicate that base being e for the natural log, it's assumed anyway. And in the la almost last section, last page, we have inverses. Just remember for inverses, we switch x and y, and then we're solving for y. Now if you take the inverse of an exponential function, you get a log, and the inverse of a log, you get an exponential function. So first I'm going to switch x and y, and then change forms. My y becomes an x, x becomes a y, and before I change forms, I want to isolate my base or my log. Here I want to isolate this base here of 5, so I'm just subtracting the 6 over. Now that I've isolated that, I can change forms. I can change into log form. So we'd have log base 5 of x minus 6 is equal to the exponent, which is y. I'm going to put it to the negative first, showing that I have already successfully found that inverse. Next, we have a log function. So same thing, I'm going to switch x and y and solve for y. So we have log base 7 of y minus 4. And the inverse of a log is an exponential, which means I have to switch to exponential form. And I can easily do that by lassoing. So we'd have 7 to the x equals y minus 4. I just have to solve for y, and I can do that by adding the constant of 4 on both sides. So we'd have y of negative 1 equals 7 raised to the x, and then plus 4. Next, we have a natural log. Again, just remember that natural log has a base of e. But I'm going to follow that same procedure, switching x and y. And then I want to solve for y. And before I can do that, before I can change forms, I need to isolate this log here. So I need to add over the 3, and I need to divide by 2. So if I add over the 3, 
I'd have x plus 3 equals 2 times the natural log of y. And then I'm just going to divide by 2 on both sides. We'd have x plus 3 over 2 equals the natural log of y. And now I can change easily into exponent form just by lassoing again. So I'd have e raised to the x plus 3 all over 2 is equal to y, showing that I've taken the inverse y of negative 1. Last, same idea. Switching x and y. And then I want to change forms. Before I can change forms, however, I need to isolate my base. So I need to subtract over that 7 first. Now that I've isolated my base, I can change to log form. So we have log base 3 of x minus 7 equals the exponent, which is y minus 5. And then I can just add the 5 over to solve for y. So y of negative 1 equals log base 3 of x minus 7. Oops. Try that again of x minus 7, and then plus 5. And that's it for taking your inverses. Next, we have graphing logs. You're going to use your graphing calculator again to do this. You can go into y equals, clear out anything I have in there. And I'm just going to enter this in using my math menu in that log base. So I'm going to hit math. Now this option is actually all the way at the bottom. So we have log base 3 of x minus 2. And then I can just hit a zoom 6. Just put in a standard 10 by 10 grid. Now it appears as though that the graph stops here. However, it doesn't. This is where we always say you have to be smarter than your calculator. Remember your asymptote in the logs will follow this left right shift here. We have a shift that appears to be left to, so it's actually going to be right to. So I would start out before I graph anything with graphing that asymptote at x equals and it would be positive 2. Again, following that left-right shift here, we reverse our logic. So I would start by drawing that vertical asymptote with a dashed line at x equals 2. And then I want to get specific points using that graphing calculator. So I'm going to look at my table. Now, if I've done this correctly, the asymptote should be the first error that I see on my graphing calculator. So 2 corresponds to an error. That's because there's no actual point at that asymptote. So then beyond there, I'm just going to graph these coordinates. We have 3, 0, and 5, 1 were my first two points. So 3, 0, 5, 1. And then if I go back to my graphing calculator, I want to say there's another nice point in there. Now you can always plot these decimals. I just like to look for those nice whole number coordinates. We do have an 11, 2. So my 5, 1. And 11, 2. Make sure when you graph this, you have arrows on each end, and you want to show it gets infinitely close to that asymptote, but doesn't actually cross it. Make sure you include this arrow here. Even though we saw it stop on the graphing calculator, we know it continues infinitely close to that asymptote. And then you can even label it with y equals log base 3 of x minus 2. And then the domain, my leftmost point to my rightmost point, 
when my leftmost point, it gets infinitely close to that asymptote at a value of two and goes right forever to infinity. Our range for our log functions is always going to be all reals. So you can write it like that or negative infinity to positive infinity. And again, that asymptote is at x equals two. And last, just a couple problems with logs. And this one we have unlike bases. So we're going to simplify each of them individually. Now, if I take this log base six of 216, and if I want to know what that equals, I can actually physically set it equal to x. I can change the exponent form just by lassoing it. And I can say 6 to what power is 216. And I could even do that with a guess and test in my calculator. Well, I already know 6 squared is 36. So then if I type in 6 cubed, I would get 216. <clears throat> so that's equal to a 3. So you're really saying, looking at this base, we're saying 6 to what power is 216? You don't have to write this work off to the side. I just wanted to be clear of where I was getting that from. Next part, we have log base 4 of 1. I'm really saying 4 to what power is equal to 1? And hopefully we remember anything to the 0 power is 1. So that whole middle term there would just be a 0. And last, we're really saying 2 to what power is equal to 16. We know that's going to be a 4. So when I combine those together, I get my answer of 7. <clears throat> now in the next one, I could even clean this base up a little bit. And just write that as y equals 2 times, if I do 1 minus 0.3, we get 0.7 raised to the negative x. Now initially we want to say that this is decay because our base here is less than 1. But this negative coefficient in the x, remember, means that was reflected over the y-axis. So that's going to change my growth to decay. So if I were to look at this, it's, it's not actually, sorry, I said that backwards. This appears to be decay. It's actually growth. And just to prove that, I'm going to type that into my calculator. That's 2 times 0.7 raised to the negative x. Clearing out what's in there. We have 2 times 0.7 raised to the negative x. And it's the negative that's going to change our decay to growth. And then if I do a zoom 6, you're going to see what we thought was decay is actually growth because of that negative in the exponent switches that around. So that would be growth. And by what percent? You could find the rate by saying, what's the difference between this value and 1? That would be a 0.3. And if I change that to a percent, that would be by 30%. And that's it.